Marguerite is a visionary speaker, public leader, public speaking coach, and workshop leader who believes in the importance of using her clients' corporate and individual culture to create innovative change in their lives, community, and business. Her powerful 360-degree Ignite workshops and talks support you or your business to find your purpose. Be realistic about risk, then challenge yourself to make the defining first step toward becoming a purposeful public speaker, small business owner, or catalyst to improve employer employee relationships. In 2018, she published her book, Vignettes of the Family Journey, dedicated to those who love, who love or have loved someone suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia. Margarita Estrada, DTM, Distinguished Toastmaster, is a member of District 83, Omni Pro Speakers Bureau. She has served her district as its public relations manager, conference chair, workshop leader, and is ex an experienced competitor. She is a member of Impact 21 Toastmasters. We create winners located in Rahway, New Jersey, and Dying to Speak Toastmasters located in Fairfield, New Jersey. Tonight, she will present Emotional Diversity, the Path of Dynamic Communication. Please help me in welcoming my friend, Margarita Estrada. Thank you so much. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank Bronx Advanced Speakers, Talk Matters, everyone that is present both online and in person for allowing me to be with you tonight. Emotional diversity is at the core of who we are because it involves our heart. Many of us do not realize it. My goal tonight is to take you on the road towards emotional diversity. I know that when you leave tonight, you're going to leave with some nuggets that are going to help you have better relationships, whether they are personal or professional. So let's get started. The death of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, moved the world to action. We saw protests, not only in our country, but around the world. The corporate environment and nonprofits such as churches were challenged to figure out how can we make this better. As a result, corporate America made a commitment to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. In the nonprofit arena, churches were having discussions, though uncomfortable, about how to make racial relations better. Six months after the death of George Floyd, DEI hires increased by 55%. Everything looked great because DEI professionals reflected the population that they serve. However, this happened that changed all of that. On June 29, 2023, the Supreme Court voted six to three to curb affirmative action in higher education. The impact of this decision is paramount. If all educational institutions were equal across the country, then the decision would make sense. But of course, we know that is not the case. The world is not perfect. And so my goal tonight is to ensure that we increase communication in the hopes that we can make things better. Because I believe at the core of all of these decisions is the lack of emotional diversity. And now budgets have been cut for DEI by 90%. And on top of that, 70% of the DEI professionals do not represent the populations they serve. So welcome to Emotional Diversity, the path to dynamic communication. Tonight we will cover so many topics. 
There are many textures in humanity, and there are textures of hair. So this is a sketch that I did back in 2005, depicting the frustration that I went through as a woman as I relaxed my hair, curled my hair, rolled my hair. And as you can see by the expression of who I thought I was at that time, I was tired. And it's the same thing in humanity. The more band-aids we keep, excuse me, the more band-aids we keep putting on humanity, the worse situations get, and there is no solutions to the issues. Tonight we will cover the difference between emotional intelligence and emotional diversity. Why emotional diversity is one of the keys to greater understanding and implementation of emotional diversity in our everyday life. The definition of emotional intelligence is the ability to manage both your own emotions and understand the emotions of people around you. It sounds beautiful, doesn't it? It sounds like a kumbaya moment. But is that enough? Emotional diversity, also called emo diversity, tells us it's not. Emotional diversity is the range of emotions that people experience, including positive and negative ones. It's based on the idea that emotions serve a functional role for people, helping them to regulate their behavior and prioritize. We live on emotion every day, from the clothes we wear, to the food we eat, to the programs we watch, to the people we associate with. Our emotions serve as a guide. And we have to learn how to use those emotions so that they favor all of mankind or womankind or humankind. So what are the benefits of emotional diversity? And there are many. First, it creates self-awareness. Because you see, emotional diversity requires for us to know who we are, what we are about, what limitations we have and what limitations we are willing to break through to get to the other side. Emotional diversity leads to better mental health because once we are aware of ourselves and who we are, we are able to think clearly. We are no longer in that confused state. Better mental health leads to improved collaboration with others. Because we are comfortable in our own skin, we are able then to welcome other people into our world and to make them a part of it in a positive manner. Next, it leads to better decision making because you are learning to have an open mind and an open heart. And it allows you to say, okay, so I'm looking at all of these ideas that are being brought before me. And that way, you are able to make decisions that add value. Next, emotional diversity gives us strength and resilience to deal with the ups and the downs and the twists and the turns of life. And finally, it increases our empathy towards other human beings. And this is the core of this presentation tonight. Remember, a shoe is just a shoe until somebody steps into it, and then it has meaning. We've all heard the phrase, Step a while in my shoes. In fact, there's been songs that have been written with that same phrase. And for good reason. Stepping into another person's shoes then makes you see, oh my God, I didn't know about this. Maybe I need to change how I think. Maybe I need to consider other factors before making judgments. It's powerful stuff. 
If the benefits are clear, why do we fight against it? Why are we afraid to see each other? And for that, I'd like to open up the floor. So I'd like some of you to tell me, why do you think we as human beings are afraid to see each other? If anyone would like to express what they think about this. In that case, since there are no volunteers, I will give three reasons why I feel that we are afraid to see each other. First, because once we see each other, we have no choice but to look at ourselves. It is said that the eyes are the mirror of the soul. When we look at each other, sometimes it scares us because then we have to consider other ways of thinking. Second, it forces us to see where we went wrong and be forced to change it. This is the challenge because then it leads to cognitive dissonance. Now, many of us have heard of the phrase cognitive dissonance, and we know Webster's Dictionary. But I'm going to give you my version of cognitive dissonance. So this is me, the created me that was put together by my parents, my siblings, my neighborhood, my education, my religious institution, and my political institution, right? All of these people played a role in creating me. In other words, they trained me to be what they want me to be. Then here is me, the authentic me, the one that says, you know what? I think I'm going to create a public speaking business. One where I see a difference in the world, where I can add value to it. The created me will say, you got to be kidding me. You've got no money. How are you going to do this? The authentic me says, I have to get this done because I believe in this. The authentic me also says, I see a lot of young people who right now need a voice. They need a place that is safe, that way they can express themselves without judgment. I know I'm going to create an open mic where people can speak, with especially our young 11 to 17 year olds who have no outlet. I'm going to put this thing together and it's going to work. And as a matter of fact, last week on Thursday, I did put together an open mic in my former neighborhood in Union City. Nobody came to support these kids, but it didn't matter because they felt that they were important and they were valued. Do you see what it takes sometimes? Sometimes you will not be supported. Your authentic me will not be supported by those who raised you or formed you. But you still got to follow your heart in everything that you do. And I promise you one thing, that when you follow your heart, no one can stop you. So now, let's look at the implementation of emotional diversity. And for this section, I want to go through both personal and professional ways that you can use emotional diversity in a five-step program. The first is understanding each other's greatness. So two months ago, I was at my friend Gail's house and we had a conversation. And suddenly she says, Margarita, I feel that we're being phonies. And I said, why? She said, well, we can't discuss anything regarding politics. And I feel that we should be able to discuss it in a way that is mature and is valued. I didn't know what to make of it because I didn't know what was going to happen here. I had lost friends before and I didn't want to lose this precious friendship of 15 years. But I decided to jump and go for it. So, okay. 
First, we recognize each other's greatness by talking about our backgrounds, where we were raised, about our struggles, what we have gone through. And it turns out, surprisingly, that her background and my background were very similar in terms of the struggles that we have been through. She is Jewish, I am Puerto Rican, but we both been through many struggles. So we recognize each other's greatness and we spoke about our contributions that each culture had. On the professional arena, if you are a team lead and you're leading a group of people and you hear good things about a particular member of your team, you got to take note of that because it's something that you may not have seen. If you're part of the team and people are saying good things about your boss, you better write that stuff down because maybe you didn't notice that your boss was that great because you see him or her every day. Then we go to step two, affirmation. It's important to affirm one another. It's not enough to recognize your greatness, but you have to affirm it. So going back to my conversation with Gail, we decided that while we had this conversation, we were going to have mutual respect for one another. We were not bad about each other. And we would treat each other with understanding. So those are the rules that we set. And when we started having this conversation, at times it got heated. Trust me, it did. But we will point at our list of rules and we said, uh-uh, we're not going to go there because we want to preserve this friendship. On the corporate side, if you're a team lead and you hear, not only did you write down what people said about this team member, but now you have to affirm it. So how do you do that? Well, you invite them into your office and you say, you know, John, I've heard so many great things about you. And now that I think about it, I remember that back in June of, of last year, we were working on an incredible project. And your idea was the one that cemented it and made it happen. Thank you so much for being the type of team member that you are. John needs to affirm his manager because there are times that managers are not appreciated either. So how does John do this without members of his team thinking that he's trying to kiss? Well, you know, I don't have to tell you any further. So John affirms his boss by showing up every day the way he's always done, doing his work in a proper manner, supporting his team. That's the way you affirm your manager, right? Next, nurture, going back to Gail. So Gail and I are having this conversation and at times it's getting heated. But we decide that you know what? Above all, we love each other. And when we finished having this conversation, we cried and we gave each other a hug. I said, I love you. She said, I love you too. She said, I'll always be your friend. I said, I'll always be your friend too. And that's how we nurtured one another. In the corporate arena, the way you nurture each other, of course, is totally different. Many of you have seen the program Undercover Boss, correct? So in Undercover Boss, the CEO goes undercover. And through a process, he knows the stories of those that work for him. And at the end of the program, he reveals himself. And he calls each member of his company in. And he nurtures them by saying, Janet, I've seen the struggle that you have had trying to raise your two kids while you work for us. And you're wondering whether they will be able to go to college. I'm putting $20,000 in a fund that will increase in value so that by the time they're college age, they have enough money to go to college. So that's how they nurture in the corporate world. Janet, on the other hand, nurtures him by simply saying, 
Thank you. So that's the imaginary corporate world, which many of us will never know. But in the real world, the way we nurture our team is totally different. My cousin Rosie is a team lead at Morristown Hospital. And every three months, she puts together a pizza party for her team, and she offers them little prizes for those that are best performers, for those that are the most caring. The whole idea is to keep her team in tune. And her members, her team members do the same in kind. Every birthday, they all give her flowers. This is the way that they nurture one another. And I think that's a, an important example to follow. Next step is attitude. Having the proper attitude in any conversation is extremely important. When Gail and I had the conversation, we both had an attitude that we were going to end up in a positive place. Our intention was never to have, for example, my intention was not to have her be on my side or for, her intention was not for me to be on her side. It was more to come with a mutual understanding of where we were coming from. And so we had that positive attitude. In the corporate place, it's the same way. So as a team lead, it is important for you to have a positive attitude at all times. It's like I always say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say it at all. Just keep your mouth shut. But ideally, as a team lead, you come in with a positive attitude, you come in with an agenda, because as all of us know, if you don't come with an agenda, then we cannot tell where we are going. You have to have a plan. You come with a good attitude, you come with a plan, you show it to your team, you move forward. As a member of a team, it's important to have a positive attitude too. You have to understand that your boss is a human being as well. And finally, you have to remain steadfast in all you do. Being steadfast is extremely important in our lives. It's not enough to just go through all of these steps, but rather it is important that we continue with them. Emotional diversity is the lifelong journey that requires work. Remember that there are many textures in humanity as there are textures of hair. And we can no longer put band-aids on issues that need to be addressed. And it's ironic that tonight is the debate and that tomorrow is 9-11. Because I remember the days during 9-11, the days afterwards, how people were united as a country. And we have to all remember that we are part of one human family and that emotional diversity is the way and the path to dynamic communication and understanding. 